It took me 12 years to learn this, but the ultimate networking hack, 50% of guys at 18, they want to be a millionaire by 25. And it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. The real paradigm shift for me was instead of having the output as a goal, have the input as a goal, and it changes everything. So for example, you want a six pack, okay, I'll do 100 sit-ups for 100 times in the whole year. And then the goal is to do the 100 sessions of sit-ups. And then you see what happens. You shift the focus onto maybe I'll reach my goal to everything in my control. I can do this. Hi, Chef. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. We're going to keep this because this is my third, my third attempt at making an introduction and you're going to be laughing throughout. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jamal. How are you feeling today? Very good. How are you? I'm, I'm doing okay. You said this is your first podcast, video podcast? Live video podcast, yeah. Okay. Give us an introduction. Who's HM, other than jokingly saying he's uh, Majesty? Yeah, you said that. Not, not, not. <laughs> I did. Guy born in Mauritius. My mom's from Re Reunion Island. Mm -hmm. My dad's Mauritian, born and raised here. Grew up here. So you did your schooling here and then left the island for university. Did you, were you still here? No, I didn't go to university. I went to school here, primary okay. school, high school. Backstory, I was like a startup slash business uh, geek, fanatic. I was passionate about business. Always? Always, like I started selling illegal CDs at 10 years old. Let's say you like uh, It's My Life by Bon Jovi. You had to buy the whole album, like a 22 song album for like one song. Yeah. And I was a geek, right? So I, I started learning how to download uh, songs. And I was like, imagine if I have all your favorite songs in one CD. Uh, and so I downloaded it. Was, it, it took me like a, a week to download one song. But I was selling CDs with, uh, with guys at school and, and everything. So that was my first entrepreneurial journey. Point of this story is uh, always love business. So at uh, 18 after high school, um, I was like, two choices. Option number one, do I go to university and study for five years on how to do business? Or I try and do business and uh, which, which option would yield me the most um, experience and, uh, and scar tissue? And, and five years down the line, which would be ideal to optimize your chances of success in business? So I decided I would just do things instead of to university. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. Two things there. So first, what was what was your parents' reaction to you not wanting to go to university? Do you, do you have siblings, by the way? Yeah, I have a brother and a sister. And did they go to university? My sister did. My brother didn't because okay. he's also like me, like entre entrepreneurial. Interesting. Okay. So junkie. what was uh, what was your reactions of your parents back then? I think my dad encouraged it. He his father was a pure entrepreneur, very successful back in the day. He um, like before in in Mauritius. Most of the um, bakeries mm -hmm. were operated by by wooden ovens, and uh, he he started implementing industrial ovens. So that was his 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 real big success in business uh, for his generation. So he created his company, and uh, and then my dad and my uncle they took over the company. Uh, they grew up in this in this entrepreneurial background, and so my dad supported the idea of just me getting reference experience instead of going to learn in theory how, how things work. Mm. And to be honest, like college for me was like just the 80% party. Uh, so that was like, do I party, do I, do I work? And I decided to uh, optimize the chance of success for me in entrepreneurship mm. was, um, was staying, uh, staying in Mauritius and, and, and work for the family business, which is, which is what I did. I don't regret that. If I had to do it again, uh, knowing that my goal is to be skillful in entrepreneurship, I would do it again. And I would advise uh, someone who wants to do business to, to do the same thing and get reference experience. Like if, if it's a hard yeah. skill, it's different. If you want to be an architect, an engineer, a doctor, like you need to go to college. Or if you want to have fun and, and, and party, you need to go to college. But I think it's, it's not a, I don't think it helps you um, as much um, if you want to do business. I love the fresh take I've been getting from this podcast because I do come from a very traditional background as in go to school, go to university. And all of them, the people in the public limelight, as in the likes of Stephen Bartlett, thought that he's in company at 18 years old. Increasingly for the podcast, I've been meeting a lot of people who've actually been, who haven't been to university. I met this girl who's been a Formula One journalist. She said she started at 17 years old, didn't go to university. So many other people missing learn who said like she started university at 24 because she wants to test something else. So it's interesting to see that 
our generation and maybe Gen Z and more like the millennial generation seem to be carving a different path for themselves. So interesting to hear your take in terms of your parents' reaction was actually pretty normal and not social. The other thing that you mentioned was about trying to find new business ventures that would bring you more success down the line. What was success to you when it comes to the business ventures? How would you define it? I think it's so subjective. I mean, like, it depends on, on where you set the benchmark, right? So I could be wildly successful. If, if you look at it with one angle, I could be a complete failure from another angle. It depends like who you compare yourself with. You compare yourself with anyone? I tend to think that it's a healthy thing to compare yourself with someone. The best way that, that I've dealt with comparing yourself with somebody else is, is like a future version of myself. Um, because ultimately, if, if, if you have a direction, you know where you're going. Two guys, uh, one person earns, I was speaking rupees, like 50,000 rupees a month. Okay. Right. And his goal is to get to 100,000 rupees a month. So he compares himself to someone fictitious or real that earns this. And then he's like, okay, I have a delta of 2x. I need to 2x my income to reach to that level. And I think it's healthy to have goals in life. But this other person, he earns 5 million rupees a month. But he compares himself to a guy earning 50 million a month. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, this other guy uh, needs to 10x his goals. Even though he's uh, earning a crazy amount of money, he feels more inadequate compared to this other guy. So his fuel to, to succeed is, is 10 times more, like five times more than, than, than the first guy. Um, so I think if, if you are in entrepreneurship, you need to be driven and have, have, have goals. Whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter. And I think in life in general, if you, if you want to achieve things, you, you need to start with goals. At least I find this to be a healthy thing. But now the, the flip side, if when you compare yourself to somebody else, then it's mm -hmm. not healthy because like, you don't know their story, you don't know the background, how they started. Was it luck? Was it blah, blah, blah? I see this Instagram course where you don't compare your chapter one to somebody's chapter 30 or something. So I found like the best thing to do, like, at least for me, was to compare myself with a future version of me, like where I'd like to be. So you actually, ha you always have like a gap to, uh, to bridge. Do you know what that person would be like? Yeah. Yeah, okay. very clearly. Is uh, that I've been part setting of your goals. manifestation goals or is this something you're willing to share? I'm not sure I'm willing to share that. Um, but I'm willing to share the fact that this, this one thing only like changed my whole life. I used to be, um, I don't know, like high school days, I was like extremely insecure, didn't know, didn't really have friends, uh, didn't really know, like I was struggling with, I think, like normal teenager identities. Um, and then, like, since I started setting goals, like, 12 years ago, it changed my whole life. Because then you have, you, you, don't, you don't realize, like, you live in the way you're like, okay, in an ideal world, and, and it's your life, so you can dream whatever you want to dream. Like, mm -hmm. this would be the best version of me in these aspects of life. Um, so what I do is I, I, I separate my life in seven aspects. So it's, like, okay. financial, um, vocational, which is different, uh, physical, mental, social, spiritual and family and i'm like okay in 10 years in 20 years or in what would be the ideal version of me in all these aspects and i have this this image and then i'm like obviously you won't be able to achieve this in one year or even 10 or 20 years but mm -hmm. this is the ideal and then you take baby steps so what i used to do is and i still do is uh, at the beginning of the year i set goals that are not too far out but not too easy to it needs to it needs to stress me a little bit. Like, can I really achieve it? Can I not really achieve right. it? And then I would say this every single year and then try and evaluate what actions do I need to take to reach these things. And then I just take action. And, uh, and I do this every year and I think it, it just compounds uh, more and more. At least for me, it's freeing to live that way. You remind me of the 1% rule from, from James Clear. I don't know if you read the book, The Atomic Habits, that it's like 1% one one every day. Books. One of 1% yeah, yeah, yeah. every day Huge. talks about compounding and such a big believer of compounding there. No, it's huge. This, I actually read this book uh, like two years ago because before I used to set goals, like, okay, I, I want a six pack at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I would never hit the goals. Um, but I had the goals, so I was like, what the fuck? And in this book, it tells you like winners and losers, they all have goals. I think it's some crazy stuff like 50% of guys at 18, they want to be a millionaire by 25. And it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And so uh, the real paradigm shift for me was instead of having uh, instead of the, uh, the output as a goal, have the input as a goal. Mm -hmm. And it changes everything. So for example, you want a six pack. Okay, I'll do 100, 100 sit-ups for 100 times in the whole year. And then the goal is to do the 100 sessions of sit-ups. And then you see what happens. 
And so you shift the you shift the focus onto maybe I'll reach my goal to okay, it's everything in my control. I can do this. So your input is your goal. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. When you think about your your journey and you think it's interesting that you mentioned that you look at your goals and you have them in seven baskets almost, right? I think if I try to put mine, it would be more like three or four, but it's interesting that you have this tangent about the spiritual life, your mental health as well, bracketed as part of this, which I think to some extent, I think now we talk more about mental health, but years ago, maybe it was somewhat not spoken about. How do you keep track of your goals though for other years? So say 2024, you lay out or you outline whatever, whether you want to call it resolutions or goals for the year. How do you keep track of them? Because it's so easy to lose sight to them, gets to June or gets to the summer, right? What yeah. keeps you motivated? Well, the goal in itself, so it's exciting. It's like, a sh- it's in nature if you're not growing. But, but does it not happen that it kind of slips through the way as you go through the months and you kind of lose track of it? Or is it there? Is it, I don't know, in a visual format? Is it in front of you? Is it written? Yeah, I go crazy with this thing. I, like, I, 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 I quantify my productivity on a weekly basis and I, and I fill in this okay. Excel sheet every day. Aha, uh-huh. um, okay, that's yeah, what yeah. I was trying to get to because I have a visual... I have a visual uh, manifestation board in my room, for instance, but that's something I look at from time to time. So you quantify your productivity. Yeah, it's like a dashboard of like, you you say you're a hard worker, are you really a hard worker? Did did you do the stuff? And then you baby step it. But once you have data, you know where you're at, you you can baby step it to go to where you want to go, even if it takes a long time. But if you don't have data, you don't know where where you're at, it's all subjective. So I'll give you a concrete example. I used to box for three, four years. Then I stopped for seven years. I broke my nose. Started again this year. And this time I was like, okay, I'm, I'm uh, more mature now. Let's do things properly. Let's do the basics right. So what is, what is, it's a tie boxing. So what, what is really tie boxing? It's, it's, it's punches, kicks, um, elbows, knees, mm-hmm. defense, offense, tactics. I was like, okay, so let's just take punches. You have a left hook, you have a right hook, uh, you have uppercuts, um, and, and then you have overheads. So, okay, let's, let's do, like this year, I'm just going to do the punch and I'm just going to do like the jab, cross, uh, and hooks. And then I was like, okay, so uh, I, took, um, I took these inputs. I'm going to do 20 sessions of, of jab, 20 sessions of crosses, 20 sessions of this, and I'm going to do this in this year. And if I execute on this, at the end of the year, I should be good, at least in punches, uh, yeah, not yeah. the rest. Mm-hmm. And then in four years, maybe I'll be good everywhere. Um, so now this is the goal. The goal is now to do X number of sessions until the end of the year. And I track it every week. Like, did I do it? Did I not do it? It's, uh, it's, it's all up to me. And if I may ask, has the overall balance in terms of managing family, personal relationships, all the different ven- business ventures that you've got going on, how do you strike a balance there? I think I'm, I'm very lucky that my wife is taking more of the workload. We have a um, son. So she's doing way more on that side. Um, I'm super grateful for that. Uh, and then for me, I, I, I'm in the middle of launching a startup that we, we started two years ago. Mm-hmm. So I, I work very, very hard, uh, 10 to 12 hours a day, just on that startup. So I try to time block an hour and a half, maybe two hours with, with my family every day. And then weekends, I spend as much time as possible. In terms of just having a good balance there? I'm not sure it's very balanced. Do you not think so? An hour and a half with your family per day, like, well, if that's a solid blocking of time, then maybe. Would you rather have quality or quantity Yeah, I mean, time? I think I'm struggling with that too. Okay. But I think it's phases in life. There's phases where you're all in, all in work and... Because now I'm young, right? You so, can afford to do it. Because as a man, I think your prime is between 30 and 38. This is where like, you're at your peak in terms of energy levels and motivation and stuff like that. So I, I don't want to regret my, my, my prime. So I'm like, okay, for this period, I'm going to go all in, because mm-hmm. um, then it's gone. Okay. Then you're old, then you're, you start, everything starts hurting and everything. Um, so I, I just want to go all in, and I'm thankful that my wife <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing me. because I'm like, do you think anyone who's like 39, 40 would be like, oh, I'm not particularly sure I agree with him. <laughs> or the prime being 30. Uh, energy 30. level, why, biologically, I think it's your prime. Right. But then again, people tend to get more successful by uh, after 40, 45 and everything. Reap what you sow. Yeah. I want to... So as much as possible now. 100%. Is there anyone you look up to? Probably business-wise, number one is Steve Jobs. I was like crazy fanatic of this guy. Recently, I've been enjoying Alex Ramosi. Um, I'm not sure if you follow the guy. Heard of him. 
probably not, the, not a big the smartest guy on mm -hmm. YouTube for me, uh, big time. The classics, like Elon Musk. Um, he's the one who divides the crowd, but I, I can see he's definitely got a vision. I give him that. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to leave. He, he leaves everything for his, for his dreams. I, I, I couldn't do that. He wants to essentially save the biggest problems in the world and not have anything else. No social life, no friends, no family, nothing. Just, just for that. And he's a genius. Um, so I admire the sacrifice, and he's doing things that are impossible to do. Yeah, I agree. But to the extent I don't agree with other stuff that he made it, he may be doing, but I do agree with the overall vision. And then I don't know, probably athletes. I try to take inspiration from from people. Okay. Some athletes I really admire are Kobe Bryant mm -hmm. uh, with his mental game, and Roger Federer. Speaking of business, you launched Subway in twenty. 2014? When was that? Yeah, so um, getting back to university, so I decided to work with, with my family business mm -hmm. for five years. Wasn't paid much. I think I was paid like 25k a month. Um, but the experience was invaluable because the family business, they, they are distributors of a few international brands in a few countries. Um, and I got to learn, I was in the marketing side, it was okay. my passion. So I got to learn how some of the biggest brands in the world were launching in emerging markets. So that knowledge was just Mind blowing. Yeah, imagine. Uh, Love the experience, and then I I wanted to solve my own thing, so I googled top hundred franchises in the world. Number one was Subway. I, I wrote an email and then uh, convinced them to give me a shot, and then. What start. was the pitch? There must have been something in that pitch. Yeah, I told them about my experience uh, in Mauritius. Uh, Worked with X, X number of brands. I, I think there's a market. They initially they initially said no. Okay. Yeah, but I was in, I was like a. So Mauritius is like a hack. Like if you guys if you live in Mauritius and you want to import any brand or franchise or something in Mauritius, just invite the guys here. Just say, hey, like, can you visit visit Mauritius? At least see that there's a market or everything. And what these guys do, because because people usually, you, you, if you want a brand or a franchise, normally you don't work with, the, you don't speak to the owner of the franchise. It's usually big corporations, and you work with with Marketing employees the, uh, who team. work with these yeah. companies. <laughs> and so you're like. You live in Mauritius, which is like paradise for most people. Uh -huh. And just say, hey, like, come to Mauritius. Uh, see, uh, like, uh, I'm officially requesting you to come to Mauritius. There's a massive opportunity that you wouldn't want to miss. These guys see this, they're sending to their bosses, like, yeah, yeah, let's go to Mauritius. No, you know? oh, I, I didn't think of this. I think 80% is them just wanting to come to Mauritius, and 20% is the actual opportunity. And then when they're here, like, you just vibe with them and have a good relationship with them, and normally it works. That's amazing. I didn't think of this. That's a great pitch. Yeah, I think number one rule in entrepreneurship is like use what you got. Use what you got. <laughs> you got Mauritius, so use it well. So you didn't take no for an answer. You asked them to come and visit Mauritius so that they could see what uh, the country is like, equally what the demographics and the potential um, customer base here. And that worked? Yeah, they came in. They saw there was a market. Um, they saw like they could, I think they saw that they could potentially visit Mauritius more often, but also they, f they saw that it was a market. Mm -hmm. I showed them that I was hardworking, motivated, and they decided to give me a shot. And so I opened the first one in 2014. It was quite successful. I scaled quite fast. Scaled out to around 12 restaurants in, in, in Mauritius. For a period of time, I was messing up because I was, so what I got to learn was 80% of a restaurant business. Mm -hmm. Like if your audience wants to open a restaurant business, uh, first of all, don't. <laughs> <laughs> Very I, honest. I, unless, <laughs> unless you love operations, because it's 80% of operations, and I hate operations. I like to solve things, and once it's solved, I put a system in place where this, like, the problem never happens again. Right. In food, you can't work like that, because you can solve a problem, and it will happen again the next day, and the next okay. day, and the next day. So it's like processes in place where you, you have to redo the work like constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, but if all your operations are good, then you, you have a, a cash machine. Okay. So, so for some time I was struggling big time because I, uh, I didn't live up to the operational standards. And then I just hired someone uh, that was way better than me in operations. And then things started picking back up. Um, and then we started making money again. And then COVID happened and we started losing money again. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was interesting. Scale that to 12 restaurants. I think it was the fastest uh, growth in Mauritius uh, for a restaurant chain. And then, uh, so Subway, then they started saying that because after eight years, you start, it's unreasonable not to be good at something if you do this only one thing for eight years. Right. So I, I started becoming good after many years. 
and then they noticed this and they offered me the opportunity to do the same in South Africa, which I said yes, and I started opening restaurants there. And I, I was wondering if at some point you actually pitched to them, but this this one seems to have been from them as in offering you to operate in South Africa. Yeah, no, I was beating the scores in the region for mm -hmm. like, operation standards. Not my forte. <laughs> uh, they were like, hey, Jew, there's this opportunity there, this 60 million uh, population country. Do you want to do it? I was like, yeah. Okay. And since I think Subway has been acquired by its majority shareholder, where, where are we on that? So are you still involved? No, no, no. So, so then what happened was uh, I was also in, in the crypto space since uh, 2017. Okay. Uh, got so got into the blockchain space, uh, tech side, and in 2021, I had uh, an idea to use blockchain tech to try and disrupt the loyalty industry. And the idea started uh, like pie in the sky, and then it gained traction really big and, and really fast. And then I decided to, because I had a choice, either I keep on selling sandwiches or I attempt to disrupt an industry, which I think we might have a shot at doing. And it's also like intellectually more fulfilling because I wasn't growing with Subway intellectually. Mm -hmm. So I sold everything. Um, I sold Subway in Mauritius to, to a, a private uh, group. And, um, and since two and a half years now, I'm, I'm fully in tech. And I understand that we can't talk much about this current project that you're working on to the extent that you can tell us anything. Uh, what's the project broadly about, or anything that you can share with us? Yeah, it's a it's a tech company. We're using we're using some latest tech to try and disrupt an old industry, a loyalty industry. Okay. So the problem with the loyalty industry, uh, like point systems, is that first of all, you, just, you, you need to spend a lot of money to receive a tiny amount of miles, and then you receive the miles once, and then you can't resell your membership tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So with with our Tech, what we're trying to solve is, is more miles. So for the same amount you spend, you get way, way more. Um, so it's more rewarding. And then it's consistent. So instead of spending once, um, like you would spend an air ticket for Emirates and get some miles once, like you right. would spend with, with our product once and then get miles consistently every single month. And then tomorrow, if you don't like your, your membership, you can always sell it back to the open market. So that's what we were building. And where are you in terms of raising funds or are you close to finalizing the project? We've raised around $5 million uh, for the project. So we've been working on it for, for two and a half years. We shouldn't be able to launch in the next three to, three to five months. Okay, that's quite imminent then. Okay. And I really want to ask uh, about the funding process, but before that, so you've had this amazing idea at the age of 10 of selling Illegally, of selling CDs illegally. It, was it not, worked, it, and it worked. It was not illegal back in the day because <laughs> there was no law. They would never arrest you as a child, so you find that the, the project that you're currently working on. You mentioned that it's already seeded $5 million. How do you identify funding for your projects so or different business ventures that you want to get involved with? Is it more of a bootstrapping, looking for external funding, look, looking for investors? What's the general approach when it comes to trying to raise funding? Right, that's a good question. So I raised funds four times. Um, one for Subway, one for a bubble tea company that, that a partner runs, one for, a, for an education startup mm -hmm. that somebody else runs, and one for my startup now. Uh, and so I, I think I've raised a total of five for that one, um, one million for the, for the bubble tea, around one million for, for the education startup, and, uh, and about half a million for Subway. Um, so I, I've, I've had some decent experience in, mm -hmm. in raising funds. I think the question is, do you bootstrap or do you, do you raise funds is, first of all, like, is, does it doesn't make sense to raise funds. Um, if you can bootstrap, because I think it depends on number one, your unfair advantage and your leverage. If you, if you've done something for eight years, mm -hmm. um, whatever, 10 years and you're good at something and you can start a business without raising funds, like, oh, all the better, don't, don't do it. Because then you get keep all the equity. For me, ra raising funds is the ultimate um, test whether your idea has a likelihood of success or not. And so even if I have cash, I would try and raise funds because it would, because I'm a naturally optimistic guy. I think everything will work. And then when I pitch it to people, then I start hearing about questions that I've never thought. So my thesis is if you can convince someone to give you money 
on your on your on your on your business, it means that it has a, a higher chance to succeed. Then you just have an idea, you're optimistic, and you can you can run. So that's the way I think about it. And then and then how do you actually do raise funds? Um, if I could condense it to 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 some essentials, I think it would be four things. Number one, uh, by far, is the size of the market. Uh, how big is your addressable market, and is it a growing market? Um, because your investors, they they want the number one reason why they invest is to is to make their money work, mm -hmm. and so they have the option of do I keep my money in the bank? Do I invest in real estate? Do I invest in stocks? Or do I invest in in private equity in businesses? Right. And normally, if you invest in businesses, you want to be able to do if it works, anywhere from twenty or fifty times your money. So you need a Growing big market um, for this for this for the investors to say, hey, this can be something where I can uh, I can uh, uh, multiply my money a uh, big time because mm -hmm. it's risk here. Like ninety percent of businesses fail the first two years, so they are they are taking much of a risk. To, so they need a big, bigger reward. So right. Number one is the market. Do you have a big market that's growing? Uh, number two is that do you have a team that knows this market that, that can execute? So that's your unfair advantage. Whether that's you, because you've done 20 years in that industry and you know the game, uh, or do you, have you assembled a team that knows the game and can they execute? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, num the, the second thing. The third uh, is your unfair advantage. Do you have something that makes it harder for somebody else if they see you making money to get in that space? Um, whether that's some IP, some partnership, some... Uh, franchise, some etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Do mm -hmm. you have do you have a brand? Do you have an unfair advantage? Um, I mentioned the fourth one, uh, and the fourth one, and that's I think I'm biased there. But uh, are, are you? Are, do they have confidence that you have uh, um, an impeccable character? You're not someone who will steal. Like, can they trust you? Okay. Uh, can you? They trust you to work hard. Can they trust you to to be ethical, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I think if you have these four things. Um, and can you sell? Like, can you actually pitch your idea? Because, because, mm -hmm. why would they give you money if you can't can't really sell? Right. What you're doing? If you have these four things, I think it's you optimize chances of, of of raising funds. And so far, you've had good and successful attempts of raise at raising funds. As you are increasingly monetizing these different business franchises, and equally, maybe one of the things we should have mentioned with Subway, you were one of the youngest franchisee at that. At that time, not sure if that's still the case, but when you did launch it, that was that you were probably the youngest. As you're monetizing these different business ventures, do you still feel that trying to raise funds externally than bootstrapping will still be your preferred option? Because I know you mentioned testing the idea. If someone is willing to put money on the table and say, I support your business idea and here's the money for it. But obviously, there's an equity contribution there and it's, it gets diluted. Yeah. Over time, as you build your credentials, which you clearly are, and you have this great portfolio of successful businesses, do you think this, that's going to get skewed? Well, number one, like uh, I've, I've been successful in raising funds because I've failed many times in trying to raise funds and have hundreds of people say, no, this won't work. Mm -hmm. So this, you have to go through this to, to understand to nail that to these four things, right? You know, so that's number one. It's expected that you'll approach a hundred people, you'll get ninety-nine no's. Uh, unless the more you get closer to these four things, the, the less you'll approach twenty people and get five yeses. Um, but you have to go through. There's there's no shortcut. There's no YouTube video that can teach you that. You you have to do the thing. It's like you want to be good at football. Uh, you, you can't learn it on YouTube. Like you have to actually do the thing. It's the right. same thing. Um, having said that, um, I think. I think I would still raise funds going forward, okay. uh, not for the funds, uh, but for the people you do business with. And so there's this quote from Naval Ravikant. He says, like, working hard is not as important as what you do and who you do it with. So it's it's not about you owning the whole pie. It's how how you'd rather own a, this a pie that big or a slice of a of a pie that big. Mm. And to make the slice that big, if you have partners who can add tremendous value that you can't add, well, together you're stronger. And so that's the way I think about it. Interesting take there, definitely. How do you go about building your network? That's, that's a, a deeply passionate subject of mine. Uh, and it ties into to, to raising funds and, and, and who do you do it with. 
And, and, and that helps you with these four things, especially the unfair advantage part and the team part. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, let's say, give me any business. Um, the, Apple? No, the one, we, one you want to do, the one of the businesses you're working on. Oh, real estate, which is really like um, what is a, it? a villa um, business. Okay, so it's a new project. A new it's event. a new one. So my, my, my parents have an existing one, so I'm trying to build one of my own. Your parents have the land? Uh, yes. Okay, so you can do it yourself, or you can partner with, I don't know, a... Um, if it's a villa, it's for short-term rentals? Or long-term, yeah, but rentals. Let's say it's, it's, if it's short-term, it's just, uh, I don't know your business, but like yeah. one of the things I would consider is, okay, can I partner with someone that owns hotels, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then now you have an unfair advantage because this guy has equity in the business. It's, it's in his advantage to help you. And now maybe they can put the villa, if it's next to a hotel, um, part of the deal. And now, so you, 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 you dilute your equity, but the business is way bigger because now they pay in euros and, uh, and, and there's like, they can use a hotel, blah, blah, blah. Like that's one, one example. And I could probably do with less debt, debt funding, if ever. Uh, there you go. Uh, if, you, if it's a podcast business, can you, can you partner with someone who has equity in L'Express, for example, mm -hmm. right? So now it's his advantage to help you with his whole distribution. So he, L'Express, for example, took, I don't know, 50 years, whatever, how long right. they've been there, to build a network. Now you have the network and just by giving them equity and, and, and make, and making business with them. It's, it's, it's much, it's a different scale. Uh, so that, that's how I think about it. And then in terms of how do you build your network, um, caveat there, um, I was extremely um, bad socially, like very, very bad. Okay. Um, I don't know, I was like, like very, very bad socially. Um, not sure why, but, uh, but uh, I was bad socially. So I started reading a lot of books, uh, practicing. I used to go to nightclubs to talk to people alone just to practice and read books and like, improve myself, blah, blah, blah. So it's a really passionate subject of mine. And uh, again, it took me 12 years to learn this, but the, the ultimate networking hack um, is not actually a hack. It's how can you add value to someone mm -hmm. um, and do that as much as possible. So I find myself, I found myself um, more and more in, in, in rooms that I, I did not deserve to be there. Like uh, with celebrities, with guys who sold businesses for $400 million, with billionaires. Like I find myself in these kind of rooms and it is, it's, it's so scary, right? And it can work with anyone. And the thing is, uh, how can you add value to someone but without asking them, how can I add value for, uh, for you? Um, so, so the way I think about it is I, 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 I meet the person mm -hmm. uh, via connection or whatever. And then I try and see where they're at. Um, and then I ask them, like, what's the next step for you and what you're doing? Like, what's the most important? I try and figure out, and you'll be much better than me because naturally you're good socially. I would try and figure out, okay, what, what's passion, what's, uh, what interests them now? Like, in, in the business life or whatever. Right. It's either like something around business or health or relationship. And then they, there's going to be one thing that, that, that's their main focus, one thing they're obsessed now. Everyone's obsessed with something now. And, so, and then so, and then you ask them, like, what's the next step for you? Um, the next step would be, okay, I do, like, uh, one question I like to ask is, if you have a magic wand and you can achieve anything, what would that be? And they tell you, hey, that would be this. Mm -hmm. And then you ask them, okay, so what's, what's blocking you? Like, what's your biggest challenge? What's your biggest stress? Like, what's stopping you from getting there? And then they'll often tell you. So now you know this person, what, what they're obsessed about, where they want to go, and what's blocking them. And then you do everything you can to try and, and, and help them, however you can with your networks and everything. And the key is you never ask for anything in return, ever. And you expect them not to return the favor. And, uh, and, so, and the more you do that, the more normally people feel um, like they, they want to help you more than somebody else yes. who, who is just like asking for stuff. Because mm. mo most people are, are tit for tat. Most people are like, I do this for you, you do this for me. That's like 80% of people. Right. And then pe some people are takers, you just take. Uh, which works in the short term, but then you burn your, your cars and no one wants them. to do business with yeah. you. So it's like, just give as much as possible. Don't ask for anything in return. Um, and then people are like, wow, for a gem, so awesome, you know? And, like, and the day you, you want to ask something, like they, it's very likely they will respond positively to you versus somebody else. Or not, but it's, it's, it's much more likely. So my networking strategy is just give as much value as possible to as many people as possible, eventually, that's how your network builds organically. What's an insult that you've ever received that you kind of feel like, hang on, that was kind of a compliment to me? Like crazy, extreme, uh, yeah, weird. The reason I ask this is because weird. you've got a lot of passion about what you do, what you want to achieve, which is great. I feel very motivated by this. Yeah. But it's interesting because at the beginning we were having kind of pre-chat. So 
and kind of wonder there, yeah, have you ever been insulted but you kind of taken it as a compliment looking back? So extreme would be one? Yeah, extreme or weird. If you want to do amazing things, then you can't be the norm because the norm means that you're not amazing. And so to be amazing, you have to be different and to being different means being a little bit weird. So before I used to be insulted about that, now I'm like, yeah, like obviously this is where I want to go. So obviously I can't do things mm -hmm. like everybody else because then I get, I get average results. So you had this and then you went on thinking about different ideas. You had Subway, which has worked. You've sold that to you, the, the main shareholders since. And you're working on something else that's now seeding already like 5 million. Have you ever had any business idea that failed? Yeah. Or never really came to fruition because you were like, oh, maybe it's not going to work, but you never really bothered. Oh, yeah, I have business ideas all the time. Um, that's the challenge because I feel like, so I, I had this before I, I had Subway, then I had a juice bar, didn't work. Um, I had another company, didn't work. Um, and I feel like when you're new at entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. you want to hedge your, hedge your um, risks, hedge your bets, hedge, hedge your risks. I don't know, you understand. Um, and so what often happens is you start this business and then it gets hard. And then you're like, okay, if I start another business because you have an idea, uh, you have one chance. If one works, then then you have one chance. I would do mm -hmm. two to succeed. And then you do this more and more. And then you feel like, hey, this uh, you have five businesses now, so one of them should work. But the problem is that you, you dilute your attention. And so what I learned was that the 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 best path to optimization of success is to not do that, is to choose one business and do it for a long period of time, like at least seven years. Okay. So most people, when they go in business, they have an idea and they, and they do it for two or three years mm -hmm. and then do another, other businesses. So the, the hard part is to say no to all the opportunities, even, though, even if, if they're good and do this one thing for seven years without knowing if it's going to be successful or not. And I think this optimizes chances of success because it's unreasonable, like you do it so often that it's unreasonable to believe you'll, you won't be good at it after seven years. It's like, if you study medicine for seven years, like you'll be good, you know? If you do this one thing in this one market with this product for seven years, like it's unlikely you won't be good. Like me, I was terrible at restoration, so I started becoming good. I won this opportunity because I just stuck to it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like number one advice to my younger self, if you want to do a business, you, 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 choose, you choose the market really well, which is the number one criteria. Okay. Uh, you can have the best business idea in the world. If there's a tiny market, it will never work. Um, you can be the best. You can be Elon Musk. If you're selling, if you're selling you know, newspapers, it will never work. Uh, you can be an average entrepreneur, but if there's a massive market behind, uh, you have a much more higher chance of, of success. So number one is what I, I would tell my younger self is uh, choose a, a big market mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's growing. And number two, stick to it for eight years and it should work. It should work. I mean, it's unreasonable for it not to, because if okay. the market is, is big and it's growing and you, and you work hard at it, but for eight years, mm -hmm. at seven, eight years, well, initially you'll suck at it for sure, because you've never done it yeah, before, so. but, but the more you do it, the more you'll be good. And then there's like few people stick to it for, for seven, eight years. So then you'll be at, at this level where, okay, you, you know what you're doing mm -hmm. and then you have a massive market. Um, that's, it took me a long time to, to learn that. So I'm trying to get into real estate right now. I don't know, I don't know if I've said it openly, but I feel like I've got a construction thing going on and I'm still like trying to look at other things. And I'm like, my mind is just like looking at so many different things at the same time. And I feel like I keep telling my dad, we'll never finish this, we'll never finish this because I just feel like we're not prioritizing it. So I feel like to your point, like my attention is so diluted at the moment. Got different things going on and I'm like not prioritizing what I really want to get done first. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's very normal. It's, it's human nature. There's like, Hormozzi speaks about it. You, you've seen this, this, um, this graph of um, like the emotional cycle of change. Mm -hmm. When you start something, you have uninformed optimism. So you're like, hey, this guy's making money with a, a real estate in Grand Bay. I should do this. Yeah. So you think the grass is green and it's easy to do. So it's, that's the uninformed optimism phase. And then you get into informed pessimism. Now you know, okay, <laughs> there's shit in this thing. It's hard. Um, it's not as easy as, as I thought. Okay. But you, you, you keep at it. And then you keep going and then you get to the value of despair. This is where you're like, okay, like 
guys aren't paying me, the construction prices are going up, like this is horrible. You have a podcast now, it could be, uh, I don't know, like, viewerships aren't growing well, it's, it's hard. And so most people, what they do is they, they quit at the value of despair. Because then what happens is, oh, this other friend is doing this, I don't know, catering business. Uh, and it seems easy and they're making money, so maybe I should yeah. drop this and, and do that. The problem is that now you have like two years of experience in this, of, like, of course you won't be good. Uh, and this guy has uh, more years of experience. But, so now you, 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 you stop your learning path and then you start doing something else and then you restart from scratch and then you have the same thing again. I didn't form optimism and then you, you, you get yeah. to learn that there's shit in this business too. And then so most people, they do this, they start something, and then it gets hard and then they yeah. quit, they do something else. And they keep doing this. Uh, but the hard part is just to stay in it uh, for a long time. And it sucks. It's, it's like you won't even know if it's going to work or not. Um, I've been in this phase like twice. Um, but ultimately, you start getting, getting in a phase where you, you do it so much that uh, you suck less and less and less and less until what you do is, 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 is not sucky at all because now you know what you're doing. Uh, but this takes time. Um, but, and this takes focus. You've talked a lot about the seven, I don't know if you realize, but you mentioned seven to eight years a few times as in the potential time frame, And maybe that's subjective um, given how much time you spend on the license subway. Um, I kind I of- think I think I've seen this uh, with many successful entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a seven to seven, to, years ten, seven to 10 years. Okay. Like okay. seven, eight is like minimum. Okay. Um, so the best that I've found was they did one thing for like 30 years. Which was, if you remember? Uh, it's a real real estate company. Real the guy's a billionaire. He lives in Mauritius. I can't, I can't uh, mention it. That's you go on his LinkedIn experience, like one company, 33 years. Easy, you know, like easy. The fine. OG. Okay. <laughs> easy, fine. Okay. So seven to eight years, say we go with minimum. seven to eight years of minimum to try to bring a business idea or whatever else could be a project, something going on for you to bring that to fruition and hopefully reach a good conversion rate in terms of success there. What do you say to someone who's actually had more failures than successful attempts? How do you rise from a failed idea or a failed business? Well, I think that's the only way to learn. Because there's no, like, there's no real playbook on how these things work. Like, the fallacy is to think there's a way that you just follow these steps. That like, you can do this to become an engineer. Okay, you, you just follow this, now you get it, and now, and now you just do the thing. But it doesn't work like, that way. Because um, let's say a business is supposed to do I don't know, 10 million rupees a year in, in profits. If the guy knows how to do it, he won't be a teacher teaching you how to do it. So the only way to know is to actually test things and, and learn. And to test things, you need to fail. It's not like a, it's a pre prerequisite. Like you need to, and you fail way more than, than you succeed. I think the mindset that, that, helped, that helped me was, and that was hard too, because you, you always feel like you're, that you're not succeeding, is, is to treat it as experiments. Okay, you try and it doesn't work, and then you have no idea how you're going to pay your employees, and then you're living on credit card debt for, mm -hmm. for a long time, and then you, but you, you just keep, you just need to keep going. But it's, it sounds like, uh, like woo-woo advice, you know, like never give up, but it's like, it's, it's just this. I think it's, um, I sometimes find it surprising and maybe I wasn't like that, but I think my mind's been a bit conditioned. I think we were chatting at the beginning of the podcast and I said, my mindset has shifted a bit. And I, I do find it surprising because I think it would hurt so much more not trying at all. And when it's something that you've dreamt so earnestly of, than failing. Because then through the failing, obviously, comes the learning. And it's just about redirecting maybe potentially your idea, your business, whatever it could be of. But I do feel like, I, I wonder why people are so afraid of even trying when it would actually hurt a lot more than not doing it at all. Yeah, for me, like, you're, you're going to die one day, right? And you have this dream, like... Don't you want to, like the worst, the worst nightmare for me was to be like, is to be 85 mm -hmm. and then you're dying. And then you're like, I, I wish uh, I tried this. So I think about me at 85 a lot or probably more with <laughs> technology, but you don't know. And, and I like this number one fear uh, that I have is, is I don't want to try, not, not at least try. I don't know if it's going to succeed or not, but at least I want to try. Like there's this book called The Five Regrets of the Dying. It's, it's. So 
a counselor who, who her expertise was counseling um, patients dying of terminal cancer. And so she always asks them the same question, like, what's your number one regret in life? And for, I think, something like 20 years, she just compiled these answers of people dying. And the number one regret people have um, is that the, the phrase is something like, I wish I live a life true to myself, not a life uh, imposed by society or somebody else. And so like, you're going to die anyway, and it's not going to matter um, mm -hmm. if you try it or not, because everyone who's going to judge you is going to be dead too. So just might as well go for it. Because I think there's no such thing as losing completely. Because I think for the learning, you either learn humility, humility or you learn how to relearn to do it better. You kind of rejig and you go about it in a different ways. You eventually do win something. There's no well, such you, thing you, as you, losing you, completely. Well, you lose completely if you quit. Because then you've lost. Then you're, you're no longer in the game. Mm -hmm. This is losing. And if you never quit, like you're always learning. You're always growing. And you always get a little bit further to that goal. But the, again, like there's, this is a hard way, but then there's the less hard way, which is the finding growth hacks to get there faster. Mm -hmm. So for me, and, and, and I, again, I took a long time to learn this, is, is I try and see, I, I try and fast track the learning by seeing like who's, who made it. How did they do it? And ask them like, what's your 80-20? Like what's the 20% thing that you do that yield 80% of your results? Okay, now that you know this, what are the inputs that you do to do this? Okay, I do, I do X number of this, I contact this person, I do it that way. And then I just, okay, then I have, because this guy spent his minimum seven years to learn this. Mm -hmm. Now you have this on, on, on a platter. And, and so this saves you a lot of time. Is there any such growth hack that you've personally implemented? Yeah, all the time. Now it's a habit, but uh, once, once you understand how this works, uh, you just do it as a, as a habit. Like with, with, with my business now, mm -hmm. I, um, I just partnered with a guy who, who made it big in this industry. And now I, I steal his seven to eight years minimum uh, in that space and you just grow, grow much faster than that. If I was to start a podcast, I would reach out to really successful people um, in your niche or, mm -hmm. and ask them, how, how, like be, be nice with them of course, like vibe with them. Right. And then uh, try and find a way to help them first because then when you help them, it's, it's more likely in whatever you can, it's more likely they'll help you. Mm -hmm. And then ask them like, hey, like, uh, if you had to start your podcast again, how would you do it? My one uh, growth hack, and I don't know if we can apply it to your field or not, but I met, um, I keep talking about him, but Ali Abdal, who is the number one productivity expert, kind yeah, of cool guy. YouTuber. Uh, I went to, I actually did his YouTube Academy course, um, kind of met him at one of the events. And he said two things. He was like, one, tap into your unfair advantage. Everyone has an unfair advantage. Yeah. Just try to identify what that is. And I remember asking him and I say, well, I'm having a podcast. I have this podcast I'm trying to do. I'm trying now to launch the videos as well on YouTube. And he was like, why do you want to go for the podcast? I'm like, I love it. I love, I get a good dopamine hit from it. Love talking to these people. And then he goes, but it's actually quite tricky to grow on YouTube with a podcast because it's not about you. It's about the guests. And I said, but I would still do it for free because I enjoy it so much. Um, so I'm still doing it. But then he said, think about what else do you do? And I say, well, I kind of work in finance. And then I mentioned this girl who does YouTube videos. And then he goes, well, you're a woman in a finance industry and there's not many YouTubers talking about finance. So I've done two solo videos on finance. But anyway, that goes back to him talking about its advantage. And then the second one was about having systems in place. And you mentioned, which is interesting because you mentioned Subway and the operational processes. And I can see why you might... Um, I don't know if I could sense some frustration, but it seems like you're someone who would rather have processes in place and then move on and have kind of a smooth process in place. And he mentioned having processes in place is super helpful. So to this, to this point, I've sort of tried to have an editor for the podcast because I realized I hated it so much that I would lose the joy that I would get from my podcast chat and eventually hate editing so much. So mm -hmm. there's more like my two, if, if you can call them growth hacks, but those were the two that he shared that I thought was super helpful. Uh, and I, I feel like you're naturally good at this too, which is your unfair you. advantage. Because I don't know, you, it's, it doesn't feel like an inter interview, like you bounce back ideas and you, I don't know, it just flows. So I, I can see the unfair, unfair advantage. Okay, here. well, yeah. haven't grilled him, haven't grilled him enough. <laughs> Looking back at your childhood, is there anything that you think you really enjoy in your childhood and you really like your baby to enjoy that too? Or equally, is there something that you feel 
Um, I really wish I didn't have to either, whether that's a competitive education system or whether that's any kind of struggle that you feel like, well, I would like to make it easier for my child. It's interesting that you're talking about this. So as a parent, um, the first thing you have in mind is, okay, you want, your, you want the best for your kid. Uh, but not many people actually sit down and say, okay, like if you take a first principles approach, you're like what does it mean to have the best for your child? Mm -hmm. And uh, so my wife, she's even more of a uh, actually super smart, uh, super smart person. So we sat down and uh, we were like, "What does it mean to to be the to have the best for Same. for your children?" And we it turns out that the first five years of your life, as a when you grow up, is where eighty percent or ninety percent of your subconscious forms. And I think Bill Gates says something like the the way you the, the the way the first five years of your, of your life happens, it dictates the rest of your life. And so, because your subconscious is, is most of your mind, it, it mm -hmm. dictates how you think, how you feel about yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So if it's that important, um, we, I, we saw that most of the attention goes to later on with high school or university, et cetera. And we're like, no, this is like 80% of the, of, of the job is the first five years. Which so, you can control with that home conditioning. We had no time. idea. So we read books and uh, we, we went on Google and we're like, what's the best education system for ed education in, in the world? And because you want the best. You don't want the best in your country, you want the best, period. Uh, and number one was Finland. And in terms of that, they have this uh, amazing education system that's based on individual talents, that's based on play, and, it, and, and the data suggests this is the best uh, in the world when you actually compare them to like, hard academic stuff later on. Uh, but also holistic KPIs like happiness and uh, yeah, they creativity, have et cetera, et countries have. Yeah, so we're like, okay, let's, let's move to Finland. Okay. <laughs> well, it's it's the weather is not not the same uh, over there. Um, so yeah, so we we're working on a like she's working on a startup that's uh, based on the best education system in the world. So yeah, I think it's gonna solve a real problem. It's not a problem like we have good schools in Mauritius. But we don't have the best system in the world in Mauritius. And so for parents who want the best in the world in Mauritius, at least for us, we do. Um, this is going to be a started base here, but we're producing some of the concepts that you may have come across during your research in the Scandi countries. No, it's going to, going to be a partnership with the University of Helsinki. Like it's actually the system that's ranked number one in the world that's amazing. that we're running here for parents who want the best for the kids. Yep, and I think you're going to have a good... You're gonna have a good take up, I'm sure. Well, if you're solving, I think again in, in business, if you're solving a real problem uh, or you're adding real value, it should work. Yeah, if, like, set race paragraphs. Are we still sticking to seven to eight years or are we giving this less time? Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. HM, it was amazing talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time, being here, sharing your passion, sharing some good tips and growth hacks. Love speaking to you and I can only wish you the best for you and your family, especially in 2024 and many more years to come. But hopefully your business, which is one of the main things that you're currently working on, that comes to fruition and we can see more and hear more and talk more opinion about it, hopefully on another podcast when I'm next year. Thank you for being here. I would love that and thank you so much for, for your podcast. Yeah. I think you're really talented. I think you'll, um, you'll grow uh, seven, eight years. You'll grow, <laughs> you'll grow a massive podcast. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you.